OK, hello everyone. I hope you hear me well. My name is Alesh Holovar. I'm coordinating the hybrid neuro project. And uh, today we gathered uh, for the webinar entitled Data Management and Ethics. So this webinar will be split in two parts. The first part will be lectured by Dr. Milan Oystershek, a big expert in the data management. And the second, more practical part will be lectured by Dr. Matthias Diwiak. Before we begin, uh, allow me to uh, present a few words about the Hybrid Neuro project. Uh, we started it uh, in January last year, and uh, by now we conducted quite many activities, including two workshops. The project focuses on hybrid neural interfaces and their promotion uh, in the uh, clinical practice. And uh, among the others, we will uh, organize one exploratory research project, two summer schools, four workshops, eight webinars. This is the third webinar in the row. Uh, we will uh, form a biomedical signal data repository, uh, one massive online open course, and uh, international uh, hybrid neuro hub, uh, which is intended to bring all the stakeholders uh, uh, in the field of hybrid, hybrid neural interfaces together. So, uh, as I already mentioned, um, um, this is a very active uh, European project. So, uh, welcome to follow us on the Twitter, on the X, on the social medias, and of course on the uh, web page. You have the address here on the right. And I will uh, use this opportunity basically to invite you to the summer school that will take place uh, this summer from July 8th to uh, July 12th uh, in Maribor, Slovenia. You can see the topics and of course all these uh, uh, summer schools that will follow are uh, published, advertised on our web page. Uh, you are cordially invited to uh, join us on all these occasions. Um, today, it's a webinar about uh, data management and ethics, and uh, it is my great pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Milan Oystershek to present us the first part of the webinar. Enjoy. Uh, in first part, I will present some theoretical theoretical part of uh, this uh, subject, how uh, we need to obey uh, the, uh, ethics in data management. Uh, first, we will start with uh, reproducibility of research. For rep reproducibility of research, it's very important uh, that we have uh, all all research result opens. So, uh, opened. Uh, so important is that we have possibility to uh, open uh, 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 to use open access publications without any fees, open data, open software, open services, and workflows, open research infrastructure, uh, open learning materials, open research methods, open lab uh, notebooks. Uh, uh, also, uh, important is to have open peer review. Uh, and all these lead to rep reproducibility of research. Uh, so there is um, a life cycle of research. First, we, when we start with research, we prepare a hypothesis and uh, also we prepare a um, uh, we prepare a um, proposal for uh, our fund founders and uh, uh, when they give us some uh, financial support, then we start with data collection. Uh, when we collect data, it is very important to clarify usage rights, also uh, ensure uh, that we give uh, credit through citations. Also, we need to prepare 
a document for ethical approval for uh, data management plan and uh, we, we need to prepare uh, our informed consent for our participants. Uh, when we collect all data, we process this data, store results, uh, uh, research results and also this uh, data and then uh, prepare this data for long term preservation, uh, publish this data and uh, distribute uh, this data to some repositories and if we uh, add proper license then users or our other researchers has possibilities to reuse our our data inside our work and in open reproducibility of research uh, uh, this is based on um, irreproducibility studies, uh, open lab notebooks uh, with open laboratory research records, diaries, journals, workbooks. Uh, open, the, we open also op the workflows, uh, processes, software. We also uh, publish uh, software which we produced inside the research and we also um, define ground rules to assist uh, with the recreation of uh, research experiment and studies and also we uh, have possibility to establish a process of validating uh, uh, of uh, our research result. For all these uh, studies, we need open archives, we need open services, open workflow tools, and of course, we need open data. These are this data, if it's possible, uh, we publish this data uh, to everyone free to use reuse and distribute, but in some cases if we work with sensitive data. Uh, we also publish data as open as possible and close if this is necessary. And we have many types of research data from raw data, clean data, some data which is uh, from experiments, from simulations, for emulations, from interviews, uh, from text analysis of corpuses, from text mining. And these data are, are from different types, for example, numerics, textual, audiovisual, spatial, also some specific uh, data types for scientific disciplines and also so, some specific data types for uh, uh, measures. And in what is ethics in data management? These are set of principles, guidelines and standards that govern uh, the responsible collection, storage, processing and usage of data. And the most important key aspect uh, is privacy of individuals. Other aspect is transparency of data collections, data, uh, data usage and also access to data. And if we have data, our data need to be accurate and reliable. Uh, we need to establish clear policies uh, and also we need to establish responsibilities for data management. Important thing, if we work with, uh, uh, with uh, sensitive data is how to protect data from uh, unauthorized, uh, un unauthorized access, breaches and cyber uh, attacks. Also, we need to obey relevant laws, regulations, and also some industrial standards. 
Uh, and important is that we align uh, usage of data with ethical principles. Uh, important thing is also clarification of ownership's rights. Uh, and also what is important is that ethical data management uh, is ongoing process, infinite process. We need to uh, monitor, evaluate and improve our process. And why data ethics are very important? First, we need to protect individuals. Uh, uh, also, we need to build trust with users who are the more likely share their information. We need to mitigate risks. Important is that unethical data practice uh, can't lead to security breach, breaches, discriminations, and bias in AI algorithms. Now, AI is very big danger for uh, data ethics. And in Europe, we have different legislation. The most important legislation in uh, management of uh, the data management ethics our general data protection directive. It sets strict requirements for the collection, storage, processing, and transfer of personal data and imposes significant penalties for non compliance. Uh, similar is UK Data Protection Act. Uh, also in European Union, we have European Health Data Space and uh, in uh, inside this European health data space, European uh, Union, Union uh, Council produced some documents like data governance acts, uh, also some guidelines for primary use of data, secondary use of data, uh, regulation uh, to set up European health data space, harmonized rule for unfair access to use of data measures for high common level security of network and information systems across you. Uh, in United States, uh, I'm not so familiar with United States uh, legislation, but in uh, sensitive data, uh, health insurance portability and accountability act is one of these, uh, one of these important acts. But uh, I think that uh, our participants from United States or Canada, uh, they know a lot about their legislation on this research area. And what are problems with research data management? There are a lot of research misconducts. One, Exemplar plagiarism. It is possible to plagiarize data from other paper or from uh, they use uh, other data sets and publish these data sets as uh, these data sets are from 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 uh, uh, from 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 them. Uh, also, another thing is duplication of data. They duplicate data and publish. Uh, publish another paper with other results, not the same research results. Uh, and also, they slice uh, data sets into several data sets. For example, for every month they have another data set because in some countries it uh, are very important that you have uh, more bibliographic references. Uh, but 
for all study you need, uh, for example, one year uh, of data and you need to have 12 data sets for this. Uh, also, another thing is what is very cru cru critical is uh, all, a, a lot of researchers use uh, companies or some other colleagues, for example, especially from Asia, India, China, etc. And they produce papers for uh, their, uh, for them. Uh, this is called paper mills. And also problem is gift authorship, so that some, some don't work so much in the paper. Or, or nothing and is out of a paper. And there is a lot of faking data. So data, uh, especially in paper mills, uh, they produce a data set which is not from real experiment, from real simulation, or uh, from uh, some uh, some uh, some ex other uh, experiments from surveys, and these are fake data. In some cases, they have some data, and they add additional data, or in some cases, they they falsificate uh, data use one data set and change, for example, numbers in, in this data set. But this is not data set from them. They use another data set and also why they falsify data because they want the data fit uh, their hypothesis. Also, they uh, fabricate data, for example, uh, some measurements, me measurements that are, are very uh, expensive and they, uh, they make some measure, measure, measurement, me measurement and, and other measurements uh, they fabricate from, uh, from uh, real measurements. There is some examples also uh, Another thing is data amputation. They eliminate uh, appropriate, uh, inappropriate or outlier data which not fitting to a hypothesis. Or the same is data imputation. They add data in place of missing data to fit their hypothesis. Uh, now, are very important also manipulations of images. Images is possible to produce from with visualization tools uh, from from uh, from data. In this uh, call it Shah papers. There is a lot of examples I will show you how they falsificate. Uh, and if you will have uh, time, please visit these uh, examples and you will see a lot of manipulations of images. There is many image manipulations, examples in uh, uh, also another maybe interesting thing is uh, this Elizabeth Big block, block. There is a lot of examples of different types of uh, uh, data misconducts. Uh, I have enough time to present all, all examples, uh, but maybe what is important, the Retraction Watch database. If you have time, please visit Retraction Watch uh, database.
there is many uh, other research of retra uh, uh, reasons of retraction. Very slow internet is here. You will see if you and uh, in uh, if you will visit this retraction watch, and you will see what is where is problems. Now is also very big problem: AI generated images. This is one example of uh, AI generated images with usage of uh, this mid journey software. But also there is many papers uh, which are generated from AI tools like ChatGPT. There is many, many papers. And what is interesting in these papers, that also authors don't understand this content. And also, I don't know where is the reviewing process, because no one, <laughs> some papers, if you read these papers, uh, you will see that there is a lot of, uh, how I say, hallucinations. So, if you will have time, please visit uh, these sites and you will see. But now, when all papers are opened, uh, it is possible to find these texts uh, before, before it has been much harder to find uh, uh, this uh, generated text. But you know, uh, our uh, uh, AI generated tools are not experts in uh, a scientific research. Maybe in some research areas where it's possible to prepare a large amount of, of text and uh, give some opinions about something like it. For example, in uh, in uh, in law, uh, if you have uh, good corpus, uh, law corpus, maybe it's possible to use this for producing new pa papers, for for producing new legislation uh, policies, etc. But uh, for for example, for computer science, this is impossible. And why some researchers uh, might not follow research ethics? One thing is pressure to publish. Uh, why? Researchers compete with each other. Also, other thing is if you have some funds from the from the our funder then you need to prove that you work something and uh, that you produce results. Uh, another thing is that some early career researchers don't uh, know enough about, uh, about uh, this data uh, or research integrity or research ethics. In some cases, they misinterpret uh, some legislations and, uh, for example, in plagiarism, uh, in some countries are different measures of what is uh, plagiarism, what is not plagiarism. Uh, also, uh, they want also to to be famous and uh, recognized. Another aspect is financial gain. Another aspect also are uh, is corruption. Uh, 
in a lot of cases, uh, researchers work with industry and there is some conflicts of interest, especially, for example, in biomedical engineering, uh, especially in pharma if, if someone work with some pharmaceutical companies and they want that they publish uh, results, which is, uh, how I say, important for them to uh, to uh, to sell their drugs. And also what is the big problem is that researchers don't publish uh, negative research results, but also negative research results are good research results. And also maybe what is also important is that, for example, researchers discover some uh, some problems, for example, in uh, uh, in environment, for example. Uh, but they don't want to publish this because uh, maybe, uh, for example, water pollution or air pollution, because this information will have uh, will influence uh, to industry, for example, etc. So there is a lot of problems in research uh, misconducts, how to uh, achieve better science and how we promote research ethics. One is training. Uh, another is strong oversight, open communication. And also I think the most important is that we need to focus on quality of our research, not on quantity, not to publish so many papers, but these papers which we will publish will need to be uh, papers which will influence on research field. Now we have many, many journals, a lot of predatory publishers, and everyone want to publish our research. And it is hard to choose what is important, what is not important. Uh, and now I want to present how we will prepare our data, that uh, our data will be more transparent, more interoperable, more accessible. And we will start with a can. We have this can. We don't know what is inside of the can. And if we have envelope of a can, we see what is inside this uh, in, in this can. These are metadata of our content or in a can. And the same is with data. We have numbers. We don't know what is in first column, second column, third column, etc. And if we add uh, a header, we see that we have ID of respondent, age, sex, weight. Also, we need maybe for this weight, we need uh, a unit, and this unit is in pounds, for example, which is used in uh, uh, UK. And we have different metadata standards from very simple metadata standards like Dublin Core. Uh, for every data set, we need a title, creator, subject, description, publisher, etc. Uh, uh, data site standard is more comprehensive with much more uh, also uh, granular description of metadata. For example, we have for identifier different types of identifiers for contributor, different types of cont contributors. Uh, also, EDMI for Europeana, there is more 
uh, metadata for if we go on the, um, some uh, some uh, specific research fields, we have much more metadata, for example, in bioschemas. For protein, we have different metadata. For gen, we have uh, gene, we have different metadata, etc. Uh, there is also one co more complex metadata standard which is used uh, for description of uh, uh, re researchers' uh, projects, uh, research organization, and this is CERIF standard, which is widely used in Europe. Uh, if you will have time, please visit sources for metadata. And another important thing is metadata elements need to have, uh, how I say, uh, various, if we want to have uh, uh, understandable uh, metadata for machines, we need to use semantic artifacts. These are machine actionable and readable formalization of a conceptual of a conceptualization enabling sharing and reuse uh, by humans and machines and we have different types ontologies taxonomies vocabularies i will show one example of a vocabulary this is one vocabulary this is hierarchical organized uh, or organized uh, uh, or organized um, uh, terms. We have broader and narrower terms. We have labels. Labels is possible to be in uh, uh, are possible to be in different languages, but for computers are much more important to have IDs to these labels because computers I understand IDs and for these uh, interpretations of vocabularies uh, is used uh, simple knowledge organization system. This is uh, de facto standards for World Wide Web Consortium. And similar is ontologies. Ontologies are for description of uh, some knowledge. There is example how we describe author uh, publications, uh, papers, which are part of publications, articles, etc. This is one simple uh, ontology. We have classes, for example, publication. We have relations between classes. Uh, we have uh, uh, also individuals, for example, one of my articles, it is possible to uh, have some restrictions and also it is possible to add additional rules. And there is one example of one Internet of Things light ontology example. Uh, but there is many, many ontologies. And how computer understands things? Computer understand only IDs. And this is one ID for fever. This fever has different labels. And uh, we have additional attribute body temperature. And body temperature is uh, uh, 39 degrees Celsius. And from this body temperature is possible to derive that uh, this is acoustic uh, fever, this body temperature. And if a patient uh, patient has, uh, for example, uh, uh, some uh, some uh, problems, for example, with leg, with some uh, ulcus, for example, it's possible to be a septic fever. So, compute. Uh, if you have time, please visit. Uh, this YouTube video to see how it's possible to derive things uh, by machines. And there is also a lot of 
ontologies, a lot of uh, uh, vocabularies. I, I put some links. Uh, but this is not uh, all things. Maybe what is also important, also uh, researchers produced uh, catalogs of quantities. So computers understand also measurement units, dimensions, etc. So uh, what is also important for our uh, our uh, uh, data sets? Persistent identifiers. Uh, is similar as we have uh, uh, ID, for example, we have a staff ID at university, we have uh, our personal ID, we have health insurance ID, etc. Uh, the same is with publications. For, for publications, is usually used, uh, for example, DOI. Digital object identifier also handle, for example, we use handle. Uh, also in PubMed, PMID. Uh, also, it's possible to, to use URN for researchers. Uh, it is very good if you have ORCID. This is um, uh, de facto standards for uh, researcher ID. But we have also some other uh, researchers ID like VIF, uh, also ISNI, but also we have for research organizations, uh, research performing organizations and for uh, other, uh, for funders, for example, ROAR and GRID identifier. But we have also some other identifiers, for example, PID for East instruments, in key for uh, chemical substances, IGSN for uh, for uh, physical samples, etc. So there is many persistent identifiers. But why this is important? Because if we want to perform persistent, uh, perform reproducible research, we need these IDs. Uh, if we change location, identifiers. Uh, not change. Identifier, for example, of uh, one paper which is uh, moved from one server to another will be uh, same. And now we come to the to the fair. What is fair? Findable. If we want a to have a digital object. What is digital object? Digital object is research, research result. Uh, for example, data set, uh, paper, uh, software, service, workflow, etc. If we want that someone else find our, our data set, we need to assign a global unique Persistent identifier. We need to 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 have some metadata, which is important for find for 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 findability of our digital object. And also, what is important, we need to register our digital object in searchable resources. Uh, the same is. Also, if we have, for example, a paper, we need to specify data identifier. Uh, what is also important, if we want to access this, uh, this digital object, we need a standardized communication protocols, open protocols. And also, if we uh, access data or digital object in restricted access, we need authentication and authorization procedure. Uh, also important is that metadata is accessible also if we delete our digital object. And important thing is interoperability. If someone else want to use our digital object, 
uh, need to speak the same language. So we, we need to use common ontologies, common vocabularies. Uh, and also for reusability, we need to have uh, a data usage license. We need uh, to add provenance of our digital objects. And we need, uh, we need also to add some additional domain relevant uh, community uh, metadata domain or domain specific metadata standards. And how to achieve interoperability? We have different data islands, for example, and this data don't understand with each other. We have files and we want to uh, we want to to uh, to have a, an ecosystem, for example, a data ecosystem. What we need to do? These uh, data sets need to have common ontology. If we have common ontology. It is the this means that uh, we have the same vocabulary. We use the same vocabulary. Uh, we need a broadly applicable language for knowledge representation and qualified references to other metadata. And how this interoperability influence to our data ethics. Uh, we have different levels of interoperability and especially legal interoperability and organizational interoperability influence on our uh, data ethics. So in legal interoperability, we talk about copyrights, about licenses, about data protections, about uh, GDPR, in organizational interoperability, we uh, we prepare uh, policies, we prepare rules of par participation, and also governments the governments on about this data and what data will be included, what data will be excluded. In semantic interoperability, uh, we need to understand. Uh, between uh, to to make and and uh, that the data set understand each other, so they need to have common metadata schema ontologies and common interpretation of meaning and structure. On technical interoperability level, for example, it is very important how to ensure security of our data, authentication, authorization. Uh, uh, also encryption of our data. And what is important for fair digital objects? What is the digital ob object need to have persistent identifi identificator metadata and digital object is, uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, consist consisted from bit sequences, which is stored in a repository. And for every digital uh, object, we have a service uh, which, which uh, give us permission to use this digital object. And also for integrity of uh, digital object, we need checksum and also for uh, logging all access to, to access to uh, this uh, digital object, we need a transaction chain. And also we have write records, uh, information about provenance. This is fair digital object and process how to make digital object fair is called for verification. Um, I will meet this slide because I talk about a lot uh, about these digital objects. Maybe I will go to the research data lifecycle. We have 
several uh, several steps. First is planning and searching of data sources, then collecting and creating data sets, then processing and analysis of data sets, then publishing also to do digital preservation. And important is also reuse of data and other research results. This is secondary use of our data. Primary use is in processing, secondary use is here, and we need to make clear licenses. Uh, in uh, in um, planning phase, we need to, to answer to a few questions. What will we research? What research data we will collect? How uh, will the research data be will be collected? For example, which method of collection we will use? How we ensure data quality? How we will ensure uh, intellectual property rights for uh, rights for reuse data? And also, what we need to do, we need to prepare informed consent form. Uh, if we work with uh, um, uh, sensitive data, we need to prepare application for ethical approval. If we work, for example, with uh, humans or uh, animals, uh, but also in some environmental studies, we need to prepare ethical approval. Uh, uh, the application. Also important part is to, uh, to prepare a data management plan. What are, uh, what should uh, research data management plan, plan contain? There is some, maybe I will not, uh, I hope you are very familiar with these things. So I will skip maybe this part because I think you all of you work with this. And if you don't, please read this. And uh, at the end, we have also uh, we I have also some links where it's possible to find more things. Maybe what is important part are there are any uh, restriction of research data and also who will be responsible for handling the research data. Uh, and now we come to sharing sensitive data. What are sensitive data? These are data about uh, individuals, for example, humans or animals, but also sensitive data are also some data from, for example, national security, from industrial uh, property, for example, if you use data from one company, they uh, give uh, us a agreement for uh, un undisclosure agreement. Uh, so, uh, in some cases, we work with different versions of data. One data we will use in research, and these data are are, uh, are used in very, how I say, closed environment with uh, good encryption. Uh, only few researchers use this data and uh, also analyze this data, but the results which uh, they derive uh, are, are not uh, sensitive. Uh, how is possible to identify uh, individuals? We have direct identifiers like name, uh, social security number, phone number, email address, etc. But also we have a lot of indirect identifiers. And uh, for example, it is possible to uh, to connect two different facts. For example. Uh, someone study at Faculty of Electrical Engineering and uh, has uh, 
red Ferrari. And with these two data, it's possible to find who is this uh, person. Uh, so, especially in text, it is very hard to anonymize uh, these texts because, especially in uh, in artificial intelligence, with artificial intelligence tools, is possible to derive data which you don't see. Uh, for example, uh, someone who read a uh, text don't find this relation between two data, but artificial, uh, for example, neural, um, uh, this, um, how I say, deep neural networks uh, find some connection between different uh, uh, terms inside the text. And how we decentize decent uh, this data. One thing is uh, data masking. So uh, we, we, if we have possibility, we hide sensitive data by replacing with uh, non-sensitive information. Also, in some cases where uh, in which we have only uh, only a group of researchers access this data, we need good access control and good au authentication. Uh, also, it's possible to encrypt this data. Also, it's possible to use data perturbation techniques. Uh, so we modified, uh, modify the data to make it less uh, sensitive. But a statistical characteristic is of this data are the same. Also, it's possible to aggregate data, especially this, uh, for example, in statistic bureaus or national statistic bureaus, they aggregate personal information and from this information it's not possible to derive persons. Also, it's possible to use pseudo uh, pseudonymization, uh, data obfuscation, also data reduction. Uh, but uh, two people, for example, from different research fields, if they, for example, read the same text, one, for example, from social science, another from uh, from biomedical uh, sci science, uh, uh, they will find different information inside the same text and remove different information. This is also very important. If we have uh, multidisciplinary research, we need uh, different experts for data reduction. And maybe one thing is important. This is uh, sensitive uh, data tags, uh, tags, uh, what is the most sensitive and which type of authentication we need and which uh, uh, which um, dig uh, digital user agreement uh, uh, we need. For example, in uh, for example, in some cases uh, we we have open data without any authentication. In some cases, we need to know who use our data. Uh, also, the, in this case, only email is enough. Uh, in more uh, in accountable stage, we need password and we need to register and we need to click on the uh, on the, the form and agree with uh, agree with uh, conditions which are defined in for uh, form. But in more uh, in in more uh, how I say sensitive uh, data, we need signed agreement. Uh, 
it in, but only if we need a password. But in more, we need two factor into the authentication. Uh, and approval signed digital uh, the, this uh, user agreement. And maximum restricted, we have multi encrypted storage and encrypted transmission. Uh, also, I think uh, you have a lot of uh, knowledge about informed consent. Uh, I will omit this. Please read if. And also, you know a lot about application of ethical approval. Maybe I will show you one example of our project, which we work in, uh, which work our team. This is genomic data infrastructure project. Uh, we will establish uh, genomic data use uh, in uh, uh, European countries and uh, users will have possibilities to use these genomic data, but first they need to uh, prepare ethic approvals, uh, project description, uh, data analysis, plan, uh, founding source. Uh, also, they need to add peer review and also they need uh, certification or, or confirmation from institution that they are uh, from this institution and and though all this information they send to uh, European uh, data access committee they check all these uh, documents and give an opinion and also ask national contact coordination points if they agree with usage of uh, this data. And if they agree, then user uh, uh, receive data access grant. If not, they have, uh, they receive uh, a rejection to usage of this data. Um, also, maybe what I wish to uh, in face in uh, this um, uh, in this uh, uh, webinar, when we process data, we need also this uh, storage production storage based on three to one backup rule. What is means with this? Uh, we need to have uh, data on personal computer, on network, and also on one uh, source which is not connected to computer. For example, on USB disk or in on um, or in some other secondary storage. But in sensitive data, we need to obey security rules from our IT, uh, uh, from our IT staff. Important thing is how to define license if we want to publish uh, data. Uh, we have different types of licenses. Uh, and also what is important that uh, license uh, have to be easily find, find it. Uh, uh, and there is one example of one test data set, we use CC0 uh, license for this data set. Some they have some files are opened, some are in restricted access, and we need to have signed uh, agreement to download this um, data set. Um, 
I don't have enough time. If you will have uh, time, please read about different types of licenses. Uh, and also what is important is we need to publish our research data. And first, if we publish uh, our research data, we need to uh, to make a solution of copyright. We need to prepare uh, metadata for say searching, and also we need to prepare documentations for data. Uh, my colleague Matthias will tell more about this, and also we need to, for data. We need to prepare uh, long-term data management plan. How we will preserve our our data and our metadata uh, and that our data will be uh, will be uh, independent of technology and how we will access uh, uh, how how we'll access and uh, and security be ensured of this data. And the important thing is how to cite data. If I go a few slides back. Uh, there is also different types of uh, different types of uh, uh, citations. If you choose in our repository, you see that because important is that if you want to publish in one journal, you need to obey one uh, citation standard. And in every citation standards, uh, uh, you have title, you have creators, producers, you have version. In some cases, you have also distribution. Uh, Depends on your data sets, uh, data set how you will cite, but important part are, of course, where you uh, you have possibilities to find. So persistent identifier is in every, every citation. There is some link related to research data management. Uh, so if in this UK data service YouTube channel, you will find a lot information also about uh, uh, data ethics. And I will also mention our national open access structure. Um, my colleague Matthias will, uh, will use uh, this digital library of University of Maribor, but we have also repositories from for our ad, other university for University of Ljubljana, uh, repository of University of Primorska, University of Nova Gorizla, uh, digital repository of uh, uh, standalone research organization, digital repository for standalone um, uh, uh, academic institutions, and also other archives. We have also national PID service. We have big data, uh, big research data archives, and all is aggregated in national portal, uh, where we have recommend recommender system. Uh, we have plagiarism detection system. We have uh, uh, system for digital objects, their duplication. And what we wish to establish, uh, I hope we will establish in this and next year. Uh, before the publication, we wish, we wish to uh, that our researchers prepare prepare some documentation, and in the publication phase, we have uh, first uh, check in librarian part and also in data steward part, then also some appropriate body within institution uh, check adequacy of data publication 
and adequacy of the contents and metadata. And uh, on the last part, also some uh, our centralized specialized information center of the scientific field in Slovenia is this. Uh, these are um, uh, some established uh, parts uh, which uh, will evaluate uh, evaluate uh, uh, evaluate our digital objects and give some credentials to these digital objects. Uh, in digital preservation phase, we will establish, uh, I hope in two years, an, uh, an ar archive according to uh, ISO, ISO 14721 uh, standard and with usage of metadata uh, uh, with premise metadata standard. Please, Matthias, if you continue. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Matthias Giriak, and uh, I would like to present a few practical tips for um, how to prepare a data set so that it uh, satisfies those fair um, requirements. So, um, if we have some data that we want to share, uh, we usually it's uh, it's best to if we share this data in the original or raw form, uh, if we have this possibility. This is the first part of the data that we have, and then we um, usually we process it in some way, and so we also include the processed data among the the data that we share and we have to be careful that we arrange it in folders and we clearly label the all data and uh, this is the the main part of our data set of course and then we also have to uh, include uh, a special file with a detailed description of everything that is related to a data set we usually call this a, a readme file um, so that um, it's um, very clear that it's the first thing intended for people to to read uh, we also have to include in the data set a uh, unique digital identifier. Um, usually, usually we include it in the readme file and also the detailed licensing info so that it's clear uh, how the data can be shared. And uh, additionally, we want to include a structured metadata description in some way. Uh, usually this is done by uh, during the upload to the repository or if we don't use a, a repository that uh, provides this uh, functionality, we can uh, supply it in a separate uh, file, include it in the data set. So uh, in order to, to show this, we prepared a small example data set um, from our field. So it includes a synthetic surface EMG signals of a biceps brachy muscle, with uh, one uh, simple electrode grid and 500 motor units. Uh, it includes four files of uh, raw uh, EMG data at, in four different versions with 10%, uh, 30%, 50%, or 70% uh, maximum voluntary contraction. And we also include uh, four files, which are the results of the composition of those signals with the Demuse tool software. Um, here on the left side, you can see the screenshots of how this data is organized. Uh, on the disk, we have a one folder, and which is com which contains two subfolders um, for raw signals and for decomposed signals. And then we also included the readme file and a special data XML data uh, XML file with a metadata. So let's go through all those. Um, details for preparing a, a data set. First, we have to decide which uh, file formats to use. Uh, it is um, very um, wanted to use uh, an open and public data formats as much as possible. So you can, on this link, you can find a quite a good guide that um, gives you some examples of what to use, but generally for text, we want to use um, simple plain text files or maybe PDF files and so on. Uh, for tables, uh, it's best to use uh, CSV files if you can, 
or then maybe um, XML data or HDF files or something like that. Uh, for images, of course, we have JPEGs and PNG files. And for sound, uh, it's, if it's possible, please use FLAC, uh, which is open source, instead of MP3 or WAV files. And for video, now the basically all the video is shared in the MP4 format, which is uh, at the moment simply the best for sharing, I would say. But if you have some data that is in a proprietary format, then it's also um, sometimes possible to use it if you cannot avoid it. Um, but in this case, uh, you should de de describe de in detail how this uh, data is stored. And this uh, description should be visible from the readme file. And if possible, you should also include perhaps um, a code for reading and writing your files uh, in the repository. Uh, or at least some links to code where uh, links to repositories where this kind of code can be found for reading and writing files. So for our simple example, we use the um, text files for uh, we use the simple text file for readme, and we use the MATLAB's MAT files for signals. And this is an example of this such a proprietary format, uh, but we think it is still. Um, reasonable to use MAT files because uh, in our community we do a lot of processing in MATLAB and for data sharing uh, a lot of data is shared in MATLAB for in MATLAB files and uh, so even despite its um, proprietary format we provided links in the readme file for uh, software that can read and write these MAT files for example we have uh, octav software uh, which is an um, open source uh, alternative to MATLAB. Uh, Python also includes uh, libraries for reading MAT files. And uh, in the readme file, we also provided a link to, um, to a repository with a C language source code for uh, reading MATLAB files. But generally, MATLAB is uh, it's an it's not it's a proprietary format, but it's quite open and its structure is uh, completely described. So we believe it is uh, okay to share data in uh, MATLAB files. And of course, we use PNG for images and XML for metadata sharing. Uh, another important thing is to use um, uh, very um, describable names for um, describing file names. Uh, and uh, we suggest it's good practice to include the most important parameters al already in the file names and to use uh, underscores instead of spaces for better portability. So for our example, we labeled all the files uh, with a SEMG because it's um, surface EMG signals. There are synthetic signals uh, from the biceps brachy muscles with a uh, force at 10% of NVC, in length is uh, 20 seconds, and signal to noise ratio is uh, infinite because uh, no noise was added. And we also add the data of uh, the date of data creation and uh, a label that tells us that th those are raw signals. So even if you don't have any other uh, information available already from the file name, you can uh, get quite a lot of information. Um, the readme file that is the main description of the data set should contain a first uh, a general information about the data set, like uh, its authors, their affiliation, dates of um, creation, uh, the licensing info, the funding information, and so on. Um, then it should contain uh, all this access information that we have available, um, digital uh, DOI link, the unique identifier uh, links to any repositories where this data was perhaps already published and uh, an example of a citation info. Uh, it should contain, of course, a small overview of the data set contents, a small description, a uh, list of all the files that are available and possibly the size of those files and so on. And then a detailed description of the methods that were used, um, how to, to generate the data and to which parameters were used for generating data and processing data and so on. Um, we should also mention the, and give links for all the software that was used for creating and processing data and which versions and so on. And finally, uh, a detailed description of the data format, uh, meaning that the, the data inside the files. So we, we should describe all the variables that are available, which type they have and so on. 
So now uh, a good example you can of how to create such a readme file is at this link. And maybe I can show you quickly uh, how we created a dot, uh, readme file for our small um, test data set. I hope you can see this. Uh, this is an example. So we have a, this all those sections, general information with the author name and so on. We have uh, sharing information where uh, we mention which license is it, it's using and where you can find the data set. It's the OI number and uh, recommended citation for this data set. Then we give a, a detailed overview of the data set contents, all the files that are available um, in the data set and what they are doing. Uh, we give links how to open those SMART files. And then in the methodological information, we provide a detailed description of all the parameters that were used to generate the data using a simulator. And in the next section, we provide uh, information about the software used to process those data and all the parameters that were used for the demuse tool. Um, then here we include the software specific information, so which versions of the software are used and where you can find the libraries to read. Uh, those files. And finally, here is a list of data specific information. Uh, basically, it's a list of all the variables that are inside those SMART files, and each variable is described in detail. And this is for unprocessed files, and this is for this section is for processed MATLAB files. OK, so that is. Uh, about the readme file, uh, about sharing licenses. We already saw a quick overview of uh, all the licenses available, but uh, in general, it is recommended to use um, CC0 public domain license or CC uh, attribution license. Uh, for data sets, uh, it is more recommended to use a public domain license if it's possible, because uh, if you use attribution license, this can lead to problems where um, People are using many different data sets, and then um, when the research is uh, reshared and re reused, uh, this can lead to attribution creep, where you would have to provide a lot of different attributions for different people, and it gets complicated. So it's better to use um, the public domain license and then specifically ask for a retribution, not as a legal requirement, but just as a please attribute my data. Uh, and to do that, it's much more useful for um, any user if you provide a citation of the data set so that users can simply uh, copy and paste it and use this in their papers where they are using your data. A short guide is available at this link. And uh, for our example, we used uh, this CC0 public domain license and we stated this in the repository and in the readme file. Um, quick overview of this digital unique uh, identifiers. Uh, usually it is generated by the repository that you are uploading the data to, and you usually get it uh, before the final submission because it should be included in the readme file. So when you prepare this um, upload of data to the repository, you can usually get this DOI number and you can include it in your readme file. And of course, you can use not just one identifier, but many different ones. Uh, depends on what is available and what do you need for your data. So for our example, we are using this. We got this identifier and uh, we stated it in the readme file. Um, about the metadata descriptions, um, there are many different metadata standards, as we already heard a little bit about this before, um, but uh, one of the most general purpose ones and the old ones is this Dublin Core standard, which is a general metadata standard for describing a wide range of resources. It's not used so much anymore, probably, but uh, it's still, um, its building blocks are used in many other different standards. So I would say it gives a good overview of the basic metadata information that can be entered about uh, some resource. And also repositories, they often use their own standards. Uh, and um, when you upload the data to some repository, you usually have to um, use what, what is available to you. So you conform to their standards in a way. 
Uh, here are some links to more uh, detailed description of different domain specific standards, not general ones, but uh, for our example, I was looking for any specific standards that would be usable for EMG, EEG data, but I didn't really find any. So I used the standard repository um, metadata information and this Dublin Core. And I included this uh, Dublin Core information also in a special metadata file that is included in the data set. Mm, because uh, when you upload the data, as I already mentioned, to the repository, you have to enter the, all, a lot of metadata information into it. And then as a result, since the repository has all this information, you can uh, download this uh, metadata information in different formats. And here on the left side, you can see an example of um, how you can export metadata information in different formats. One of those is this Dublin Core XML file. And uh, I downloaded this file, added some more information to it because uh, I wanted to make it more complete. And uh, I included it in together in, with other data in the repository, um, in the, our data set. And this is not needed. This is just in case to show how it can be done. But it might be good in such cases if this data gets copied to somebody else or something and it's not available at the repository and then you have this XML metadata available. Uh, here is a quick overview of, of those um, Dublin Core elements. Uh, it contains uh, 15 el main elements and some other extensions which are not so important at the moment. And you can get a quick look of this uh, here. But I will not go into this. If you want more information about all the meaning of these uh, elements, I would suggest to use this link at the bottom, which provides a good explanation of this. Uh, and since we are lately doing a lot of uh, different uh, short video clips and so on and importing them to YouTube, uh, here I show an example of how to enter metadata for YouTube videos. Um, this is very important if you want a better visibility of your videos and uh, if you want people to find them. Um, this information for on YouTube, it's uh, actually quite limited, I find. Uh, it provides only fields to enter uh, the title, a short description, and some keywords. Those are the main fields, like illustrated here on the right side of the screen. And then you can add some other details, like uh, a thumbnail, uh, the language that is used in the video, uh, date of creation, and whether the video is available for, should be available for children or no, some age restrictions, and so on. So if you want to include more information, like information about uh, projects that this video is linked to, or maybe funding information and so on, then I would suggest you add it in the description field. And if you are not, if you are still using videos, but you are not uh, uploading them to YouTube, then you can also add um, a lot of metadata information to the video file itself, because many modern video formats such as MP4, uh, they support basic metadata and uh, it can be added using uh, during creation of the video using a video editor or then maybe after the creation of the video using and some uh, different video tools. Like uh, here we have a few examples of VLC player or handbrake software and you can enter this information and it's better um, because now we have metadata included in the video file. For more complex metadata uh, descriptions, um, we should be using different ontologies and semantic artifacts and things like that that uh, Professor Ostershek was talking about before. But um, for our example, I find that most repositories don't currently support such ontological metadata to be entered when you upload a data set. But it could be a very interesting and useful thing for the future, and we should think about it. Um, if you're interested in those things, I provided here a few links uh, that enable you to, to search through ontologies and check what is already available, and a few I checked also a few vocabularies to see uh, what um, what concepts are already included from our field, um, the hibernebra field. And uh, for example, I find this vocabulary very interesting. It's called SNOMED CT, and it includes concepts and detailed detailed uh, definitions of concepts such as a muscle, a motor unit, uh, motor unit firing rate, uh, action potential, 
different brain waves and uh, units such as millivolts and so on. So maybe we could uh, use this and maybe build on this to create or to um, prepare some additional vocabularies that we can use for uh, ontological description of our data in the future. So I think we should think about this. But uh, this current uh, simple test uh, test example doesn't use any of that. Another option, if you want a detailed description of a data set, is to publish a data paper in a data journal. This is a more modern approach, but it's uh, getting very popular. So there are some uh, special data journals that uh, publish data papers. And this here in the images, you can see a quick overview of a few examples of such a data paper. And uh, this is also an interesting option to use if you want. And finally, when we have this data set uh, finished, we want to upload it to a trustworthy digital repository. And there we can find that there are a lot of different repositories available. Uh, but uh, our first choice should always be uh, a domain specific uh, repository if it, ex if it exists. Mm, because uh, this enables us to share data with our, our colleagues from the same field and it's uh, the best for data reuse and so on. Um, the second option, the second choice should be to use an uh, institutional or national repository. Uh, which are usually uh, only available to local organization members, but uh, it's also a great option to 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 share your data online. And finally, if uh, we don't have a domain specific or national repositories available, we can use a general purpose repository and they, they accept the widest range of data, usually don't have many um, um, many conditions for uploading data, and but uh, they also use very different metadata schemes. So um, it depends on what we want to achieve, but usually they are the they are a safe bet still in the end. Uh, for searching through repositories, I provided here two links. For first one is for registry of research data repositories, and the second one is for open door uh, homepage. And you can use this to maybe search for your repository and try to find something that is suitable for your data. And uh, for our example, I checked those links and I couldn't find any specific domain domain specific repository for EMG data, EEG data, but. Um, I think this is also, I think that we don't have something like that available yet. And I guess this is also one of the motivations behind the uh, hybrid neuro hub uh, creation, because uh, it would be useful to have maybe a specific domain specific repository for such data. But on the institutional level, we have a digital library of University of Maribor, DKUM, um, and I plan to upload this data set to this uh, repository. Actually, I did a test upload already and I will show it uh, next. And for general purpose repository, I selected uh, the, the Zenodo one, which is uh, one repository that is uh, recommended by the European Commission, but um, we'll see this an example later. So Digital Library of University of Maribor, it's a certified trustworthy national repository, but it's only available to University of Maribor members, so it's probably not, um, not useful for most of our viewers. But here is an example of how this such an, um, how such upload of data set looks like in, in the DKUM. Um, we have to specify all these um, keywords, language types, all the metadata and the financers and licenses and all the information. And here is an example that is maybe more useful for uh, all of us. It's the Zenodo repository, the, the general purpose one, which is the, it's a very long standing repository with a large user base maintained by CERN organization. It's not certified, but its use is encouraged by the European Commission. It uses data site metadata format, and we I prepared a test upload. Uh, And I can hopefully show it here. Oh, I can. OK, so we already have a link for it. And this is how it looks like if you want to upload the data on Zenodo. Uh, this is a draft version. It's not completely published, so I uploaded all those files that I showed earlier. 
here by drag and drop. And I specify that I want to have a new DOI link. So I got this one, this link, so that I could copy it and paste it into my readme file and so on. And then I entered all the, the information that was uh, necessary for to describe this data set. It's a data set. I provided the title, publication date, uh, the creator, a short description. I specified this CC0 license. We could already, we could also add some other licenses, but we wanted this one. Additional contributors, language, dates, and all the funding. And this is perhaps more, most uh, also, also very important to provide the funders for this research. And we could also, if we had some related work, we could add it at this stage, but we don't. Uh, here are some references that are used in the documentation. If this uh, data set would contain any software, we could uh, have a special section here for specifying the software um, repository and programming language and so on. And if this data set would be a part of some journal publication or a conference publication, we have a special section here that we can fill out to include the data, the metadata about uh, journal or conference publishing. And here are some additional fields that I didn't find useful, but this is not so important. So finally, when everything is uh, entered, I, I can save the draft or maybe I can try to publish it now because I think I entered everything. Let's see what happens. Are you sure you wish to publish? Uh, let's do it. But after you publish the data, you cannot change it anymore. Oops, it looks like it worked. So I think that this data set is now published into public access and uh, you will get uh, um, in the PDF, uh, sorry, in the, uh, in the present, you, you will, the presentation slides of this presentation and the video recording and the data set and so on will be publicly shared. So you can get uh, the presentation and uh, those links and you can maybe check this data set for yourself and see how it is structured and maybe use it as an example of how to prepare your data sets. But more on this in uh, other, in other um, webinars or more information on the hybrid neural homepage.